Today we got some more actual history about the Republic of Texas back in 1843. We will read about the Texian military expedition led by Colonel Jacob Snively, which was organized to exact revenge on the governor of New Mexico, Manuel Armijo, for capturing the members of the Texas Santa Fe expedition in 1841 and ordering them to be bound and taken as prisoners to Perote Prison in Veracruz. In this episode, the Texians will encounter both Mexican forces under Governor Armijo, as well as U.S. forces under Captain Philip St. George Cook. These U.S. forces were not friendly to the Texians. They will also encounter several hostile bands of Comanche Indians. We will be reading from this book, Indian Depredations in Texas, by J.W. Wilbarger. This book was published all the way back in 1889. So here is a story from a very unique period in history, 1843, where Texas, Mexican-American, and Comanche forces all met on battlefields near the Santa Fe Trail, near the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles. In the spring of 1843, Colonel Jacob Snively obtained permission from the government to raise a force for the purpose of intercepting Armijo, the governor of New Mexico, who was on his way from Independence, Missouri to Santa Fe, with a large train loaded with valuable merchandise. This Armijo was the same villain who had captured the Santa Fe expedition in 1841, and who had treated with such inhuman barbarity the Texas prisoners taken on that occasion. The object of the expedition was to seize him and his train by way of retaliation for the cruelties and indignities he had heaped upon the Texans when he had them in his power. Colonel Snively left Austin with 56 men and proceeded to Georgetown on Red River, where his force was increased to 185. From there he marched to where the road leading from Independence, Missouri to Santa Fe crosses the Red River, and from thence to the crossing of the Arkansas River, where he halted and sent out scouts to keep him advised of Armijo's approach. While at this place, Colonel Snively obtained information to the effect that a large Mexican force was above, intended as an escort for Armijo, after the caravan should cross the river. Snively at once sent out scouts to ascertain the locality and strength of this force. His scouts found the encampment of the Mexicans and on their return reported their number to be between five and six hundred. Some time afterwards, a part of Snively's command encountered a detachment from this force, killing 17 or 18 and capturing 70 or 80 prisoners, besides a number of horses, saddles, arms, etc. As time passed on and nothing was heard from the scouts sent out by Colonel Snively to notify him of Armijo's approach, the men became discontented. And when they finally came and reported that they had made no discovery, about 70 of Colonel Snively's men, under command of Captain Eli Chandler, left for home. Colonel Snively then liberated all the Mexican prisoners he had taken at the fight before mentioned, and furnished their wounded with horses. He then moved his camp some distance above on the river, where he determined to await the arrival of Armijo's caravan and capture it if possible, after it should cross the river into Texas. About the 30th of June, the scouts he had sent out to notify him of its approach came into camp and reported that Armijo's train was near at hand, escorted by about 200 United States Dragoons with two pieces of artillery, under the command of Captain Philip St. George Cook. That same day, Captain Cook and his command crossed the river, although he had been instructed by the United States government to escort Armijo to the Arkansas River and no further. He planted his military in such a position as to sweep the camp occupied by Colonel Snively and his men. He demanded their unconditional surrender in spite of Colonel Snively's protestation that they were upon Texas soil and as he was anxious to avoid any conflict with the United States troops, even if there had been any chance of defending himself, he complied with the demand. Captain Cook then ordered them to deliver up their arms, but graciously allowed them to retain 10 or 15 guns for their defense in a country filled with hostile Indians and several hundred miles from home. Fortunately, however, before the arms were given up, some of Snively's men were smart enough to conceal their rifles and turn in a number of old scopels and muskets in place of them, taken from the Mexicans in the fight heretofore mentioned. After this gallant achievement, Captain Cook recrossed the river and encamped. 
Subsequently, however, no doubt realizing the fact that he had acted in a manner that was not only harsh, but unwarranted by the orders of his government, he sent a message to Colonel Snively to the effect that he would escort his men to Independence, Missouri, should they desire to go there. About 40 of Colonel Snively's men accepted this gracious invitation and left. A courier was immediately dispatched by Snively to Captain Chandler, requesting him to wait for them. He did so, and a day or so afterwards the two parties were reunited. At that point, they encamped and sent out scouts to watch the movements of Armijo's caravan. Three or four days afterwards, these scouts returned to camp and stated that the caravan had crossed the river. Some of the men were in favor of pursuing the caravan, while others thought it best to abandon the enterprise altogether and return home. Colonel Snively and about 65 others determined to continue the pursuit. They followed the caravan for some days, but when they came up with it, they found the escort was too strong to be attacked, with any hopes of success by their small force, badly armed as it was, and they turned their course homeward. On their way home, Colonel Snively and his men encamped on a little stream called Owl Creek. He had 63 men with him, but only about one half of them were armed, and while encamped at this place, he was attacked by one or two hundred Comanches, who stampeded 51 head of his horses and killed two men. The determined resistance of the Texans, however, soon forced the Indians to fall back. Thirty men, or all that had arms, mounted and followed them. After a chase of several miles, the Texans overtook the Indians, and a furious contest ensued, which lasted until night put an end to it. The Texans were then compelled to return to camp, with a loss of several horses killed and several men wounded. The loss of the Indians were some ten or fifteen killed and several wounded. This unlucky affair put an end to all hopes of capturing Armijo. Had it not been for the unwarranted interference of Captain Cook, there is no doubt that Armijo would have been captured and dealt with as he deserved. After the fight on Owl Creek, Colonel Snively and his party started on back, homeward bound. As previously stated, he had only 63 men in his company, and only about half of them were armed. After traveling eight or ten days, they halted on Antelope Creek, a small tributary of the Canadian River, for the purpose of grazing and resting their animals. When they were to move on again, Colonel Snively ordered his guide, Mr. James O. Rice, who was an experienced frontiersman, to ride on ahead and keep a sharp lookout for Indians. Rice was mounted on a little mule about three and a half feet high. He had gone but a few hundred yards when he came to a deep, boggy ravine. He had a long staking rope tied to the mule's neck. He dismounted and holding the end of the rope in his hands, he drove the animal across and then began to look for a place where he could cross himself. While thus occupied, he discovered five Indians coming down the path he had just traveled. They did not observe Rice, and four of them crossed over on a log below him, and the fifth, in attempting to cross at another place, bogged down, and was unable at least for a time to extricate himself. As soon as the four Indians who crossed over on the log discovered the mule, they ran forward and caught hold of the rope, while Rice was holding on to the other end of it. Both parties struggled to get possession of the mule, and no doubt the superior numbers of the Indians would have prevailed if the mule, with the perversity of its kind, had not sided with the weaker party. With a sudden plunge, it broke loose from the Indians and started back towards Rice. The moment the mule broke away from them, the Indians began to let drive their arrows at Rice, as thick as hail, and at the same instant he heard a volley of firearms in the direction of camp, and he knew that an attack had been made upon the company. With Indians behind and Indians shooting at him in front, Rice was compelled to let go of his mule, which he did, and fly to a small dogwood thicket about a hundred yards distant. This he succeeded in reaching unhurt, although the arrows were whizzing past his head every step he took. By this time, the four Indians had recrossed the ravine, and they watched the thicket for more than an hour, expecting to catch Rice as he came out, but knowing he was armed, they were afraid to enter it. All this while, a furious battle was going on at camp between three or four hundred Comanches and a little band of Texans under the command of Colonel Snively, but the Indians, finding that they could not drive them from their position, at length withdrew for a time. When the firing ceased, Rice crept cautiously from the thicket, and seeing no Indians, he started towards camp. 
On his way, he discovered an Indian boy sitting on his pony and evidently acting the part of a spy. Rice concluded that he would stop long enough to put an end to the existence of this young warrior. He raised his gun to his shoulder, one of the old flintlock style, then took deliberate aim, and it didn't fire. The young Indian, hearing the gun snap, looked around and discovered Rice. He immediately put whip to his animal and went off at a speed that was quite astonishing, considering the broken character of the ground. Captain Rice then proceeded to camp, where he was met by his comrades with shouts of welcome, for his mule had returned riderless, and they had supposed that he had been killed. A little while afterwards, the Indians renewed their attack on the camp with greater fury than ever, but finally they were so much worsted that they ceased firing, and their chief advanced alone in front of their lines, and called out Papatino, meaning Americans. Colonel Snively answered him in Spanish, and asked him what he wanted. The chief replied that they wanted to quit fighting, make friends, and have a big smoke. To this, Colonel Snively agreed and proposed that four of them from each side should meet halfway between their positions for the purpose of having the desired talk. The proposition was accepted, and Colonel Snively and three others went out and had a confab with a like number of Indians. They professed a wish to cease fighting and be good friends, and Colonel Snively told them that he was perfectly willing to be friends and would only fight in self-defense. They all then had a big smoke together and separated. But the Texans had not so much more than reached their camp when the treacherous Indians made a sudden charge upon them, hoping no doubt that their professions of friendship had thrown them off their guard. But the Texans stood firm and made every shot count one more of the enemy slain. The Indians were again repulsed with heavy loss and withdrew, carrying their dead and wounded with them. The cry of Papatino was again heard and answered by Colonel Snively. Another parley ensued, after which another treacherous onset was made upon the Texans, but was once more gallantly repulsed. The Indians then went off out of sight, and did not make their appearance again until sunset, when the Indian chief bailed the Texans and said, We all now go to sleep, you too go to sleep, and in the morning we get up, all have big smoke and all go home. To this Colonel Snively agreed. After a little while the chief called out, All your men asleep? No, answered Colonel Snively, but they soon will be. My men all asleep, replied the chief. Colonel Snively, knowing well that the object of the Indians was to delay until they could receive reinforcements, for which no doubt they had dispatched couriers, determined to leave the dangerous locality as soon as possible. He therefore ordered his men to mount their horses and march off as quietly as they could. But at the crossing of the creek, the ground was very rocky, and the Indians heard the rattling of the horses' hooves as they passed over. The Indians knew at once that Colonel Snively and his men were retreating, and they made a final charge upon them. But by the time they came up, the Texans had taken a strong position and drove them back out of gunshot. When all became quiet once more, Colonel Snively ordered his faithful guide, Captain Rice, to pass over the creek alone at the best crossing he could find, and that each man should follow him one at a time until all were over. The strictest silence was enjoined while the movement was going on. Colonel Snively stood sentinel himself whilst his men were crossing the creek. As soon as they had gained the opposite side of Antelope Creek, where the ground was smooth and free from stone, Colonel Snively ordered the men to follow Captain Rice at double quick time. When they had gone perhaps a mile, they heard the chief calling out to them again, but this time there was no answering voice, and the Indians then discovered that they had been out general, that the birds had flown. When they realized the fact that their coveted prey had escaped, they made the night hideous with their terrific yells, and scattered around in every direction trying to find the route the fugitives had taken. Captain Rice led the men into a deep, narrow canyon, having a smooth surface well coated with grass, over which they could pass swiftly without making any noise. When the Texans reached the head of this canyon about two miles from where they started, they could hear the Indians thundering down the valley of the creek, in hot pursuit of them, but all to no purpose. Colonel Snively and his men traveled all night, and at daylight they reached a place called Cottonwood Island, where they halted in a strong position. But the Indians did not follow them, or at least they saw nothing more of them. The loss of Indians and the many charges they made upon the Texans in the fight must have been very great, for although the Texans had but one gun for every two men, they were far superior to the bows and arrows of the Indians. 
The Texans' loss, owing to the strength of the position that they held, was exceedingly small, only a few being wounded and none seriously. So that's it for this episode. This follows an earlier episode about the Santa Fe Expedition, where a group of Texians, including Jose Antonio Navarro, were captured by Governor Armijo in Santa Fe. Armijo wanted to kill all the Texian soldiers, but he let his council of officers vote on whether to execute them or to send them to a Mexican prison. The officers voted to spare their lives by only one vote. Most of the prisoners were paroled to the U.S. after arriving in Veracruz, but Santa Ana ordered Navarro to be imprisoned indefinitely because he was of Mexican descent, and Santa Ana viewed him as a traitor. Navarro was still in prison when Jacob Snively led this expedition in 1843 to punish Armijo. Santa Ana would be overthrown in 1844, and with the help of a sympathetic jailer, Navarro escaped on a boat to Cuba. He then made his way back to Texas in February of 1845. Jacob Snively would leave Texas for California in 1849. He was among the first to find gold in the 1849 gold rush. He is said later to have commanded a group of scouts in Arizona who were organized to fight Apaches. He was eventually killed by Apaches in 1872. Other accounts of this interaction between Republic of Texas soldiers and Captain Cook's Dragoon Regiment suggest that Captain Cook thought that Snively's group was on U.S. rather than on Texas soil, and that his aggression toward them was caused by their killing of about 18 Mexican soldiers before Cook arrived. Those are given as some of the explanations for Cook's actions, but it is still interesting to see how the U.S. Army here protected Mexicans from Texans in 1843, just a couple of years before the outbreak of the Mexican-American War in 1845. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to show on history channels on TV. Those channels unfortunately don't play much actual history anymore, and when they do show actual history, it often follows a certain false narrative about the past. So stay tuned to this channel because we cover actual history that is now deemed unworthy by the elites who control the mainstream history channels. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.